welcome to the course International Studies in Vernacular Architecture. Today we are going to talk about advanced material adaptations and which is also the conclusion of the unit 2 materials. So in our last lecture we briefly discussed about the kind of timber frame buildings and also the wooden architecture in Uttarakhand and today what kind of responses we are able to get without having proper access to the local materials and the notion of local materials, availability of these materials have changed drastically in these for past few decades. So one can actually see that today people are not ready to invest in uh, many of these traditional technologies because one is they are not able to access these materials, the second is the absence of the skill resources, the craftsmanship who can actually deliver these buildings. So in many of the cases what we can notice is you know though many of the stone buildings which are abandoned they might have been affected by various earthquakes we can easily notice that there are common problems in these buildings you know there are sometimes the cracks have appeared in the corners there sometimes the joinery is not great so how do we provide a guidance to these artisans to these contractors who make these buildings you know like for example you can see in this particular house this was a traditional house but they later on added this concrete slab but without any support landing on the uh, timber floor. So which means lack of uh, technical wisdom you know like how, how, how it can actually bear the load of it whether having this can also have an impact on this you know so this kind of understanding like there are no some of these they uh, they are mixing various other materials whatever they are able to get sometimes they stone they use stone sometimes they use brick within it sometimes they are uh, not using any sill bands so this is what my observation is certain understanding the present generations they are not able to tap with the local knowledge what their ancestors have adopted at the same time they are trying to mix with these newer things but without having an appropriate connections you know. So here also we can see that there is no intermediate bands in the whole construction you know being an earthquake zone 4 or 5 areas so uh, it is required they should follow some structural measures but what you can actually see is a mix of different construction like you uh, one floor they use a different material another floor they use a different material and uh, sometimes the columns are done from the first floor also not from the ground floor you know so uh, in that way uh, an inappropriate consideration of these modern techniques also results in a major disaster. So we can see some of these newer buildings have fallen down and so in that notes uh, uh, that there are some uh, efforts made by uh, the Uttarakhand state that they have issued certain technical guidelines for stone construction in Uttarakhand. So the DMMC, uh, Dehradun DMC Uttarakhand, so they have developed these uh, technical guidelines and information for the stone construction. So for example, when we talk about these uh, you know laying of these stone uh, stones so how we have to provide an interlocking nature both in the form of uh, not just only an elevation side of it but in terms of the plan how we have to interlock these two wides and there is also an advanced uh, techniques which the central building research institute in Roorkee CBRI uh, also have promoted certain techniques how we can adopt the stone constructions with interfacing with the modern technologies. So this is one of the techniques which I am going to show you a small video. So basically they used part of it as a stone material and then they use the regular make this as a blocks with a certain procedure which you can actually watch in this video. And the elevation of this actually appears with uh, the stony facade you know we get these parts of uh, block is appeared on the facade it appears as a stone. So this is the kind of techniques which they have adopted and they have implemented this in some projects.
spaces for fixing electric switchboard etc should be created by using thinner blocks when large openings are needed especially for sanitary fittings full block be left without mortar during wall construction so this is the look and feel of the stone masonry block wall building this is a unique concept no doubt csir cbri has taken all the pains for innovating building materials and this time they have created history so again there are some broader guidance which has been provided how we have to do with the stone masonry and uh, how at the foundation level how we need to do uh, having a stone wall thickness of 450 to 600 mm and how we can do up to the splint level and similarly uh, especially many of these houses they are so situated neither to a water body or somewhere how we have to provide the damp proof course here you know uh, and that is what kind of uh, um, uh, what kind of mixture it could be a 1s to 3 and uh, whether it could be uh, cement and sand in the 1s to 3 ratio or it could be 1s uh, to 2s to 3 micro concrete 38 mm thick with damp proofing compound mixed in each case you know so in that way they have given certain guidelines having an uh, rc band at the plinth level and this is again a seismic band considered as a seismic band so when we talk about the interlocking of whites how we actually through the stones how like for example you have the smaller stones but how we create an interlocking through the bigger larger stones at the corners and at the intermediate places so that we can actually break these vertical joints you know so in plan if you see the junctions how do we do the junctions because most of the cracks appear at the junctions so what are the uh, uh, techniques we use in the interlocking process so this is how we have these through stones and so that it can break this wall at different junctions and it can actually bind these walls at these junctions and the also the through stones in the vertical sections it looks in this format so you have the reinforcement when we are actually making these l corners or the t junctions we can either do with this format of this having the reinforcement and or else we can have a galvanized wire mesh pieces and in that way uh, that stiffens at these corners and also this the l stone corner masonry with a kind of alternate facing one face this side and another face this side like this and so in that way we can actually develop this particular corner uh, corner integrations and also there are been a guidance especially on the hill conditions what kind of heights if you are going for a flat roof what kind of height you should go and about 3.2 maximum and here if you are going for attic how we can go all these height restrictions they have already incorporated and especially for the roof for the walls wall sections if you are uh, going for uh, wall between 5 and 7 uh, you know a midpoint we can we should provide a buttress or if you are actually going more than 7 so the buttress spacing should be less than 5 meters and in that way we need to provide these buttresses so that it can actually give an intermediate support for this wall component like what is the proportion of these buttress dimensions if this is the height of the wall and this is the width of the uh, wall and this is should be the h by 6 and this should be the width of the wall so this is a kind of thumb rules which they have provided for how to make the buttresses similarly the openings the proportion of openings how we should do like you have this a plus b plus the windows plus doors should uh, divided by the overall length of the house should be less than 0.5 so similarly like that they have given these uh, rules for both a uh, single story building or a double story building so in that way uh, it can actually uh, configure within this seismic uh, compositions and also the band locations you have these um, if you if you look at uh, the plinth band the sill band and the floor band and the lintel band then the u bands here and the gable band here you know so in that way so each of these uh, structures which which is having an intermediate bands that actually divides the whole structure into different compartments 
And uh, when we talk about the detail of the U band versus with the gable band, and this is the kind of detail which is going, the U band is here and the gable band is going on this side. And similarly, you, you can also have the corner band reinforcement. You have this corner band, but then you also have this vertical reinforcement to this. Similarly, the T-junction, again here we can see the vertical reinforcement. Of course, the details of these reinforcement go along with the structural calculations. And uh, similarly, when we talk about the shear keystones, you know, how we actually do these bands and then we have these stones vertically and then we place that, uh, the rest of the stones, you know. So again, the vertical, the how to prop the vertical things and sometimes we also use this PVC pipe and which actually supports this vertical reinforcement. And if you look at the vertical reinforcement, you know, the, the pattern, the way you have to keep this vertical reinforcement is also had been advised. So for instance, it has to be bent on from, so that it ties the whole building in one go, you know, this is how uh, the process has to be done. And similarly with the openings also in the similar format. Like you can see at the openings, at the junctions, at the corners, you know, so it has to be bent and connected to the slab reinforcement. And there are also advised how we can use the combination of wood block through the stones. So how we can actually use wood block as uh, through stones and so that it can actually give certain resistance to any kind of movements. So that is uh, some of the details about certain technical guidelines. But now I'm going to talk about uh, some other systems which, uh, which has been implemented in the housing projects. Like in the past, we have also discussed about the earthen technologies, adobe constructions, and the compressed stabilized with blocks. So now I'm also going to talk to you about the prefab understanding at, uh, at a small scale or uh, medium scale housing projects. So uh, here these are developed uh, uh, by the CBRI and these are referred as a brick bat panel technology. And uh, the photographs are from the technology park. And uh, so th this is about, uh, uh, 53 centimeters by about maximum of 1200 mm and you can see that these uh, uh, there is a, a, a parallel reinforcement on either sides and basically what they do is they place these bricks and then they mix with this concrete. So for instance you have these about maximum of 1200 or 1150 we can go and about 530 mm is the width of these panels. and. We have to, uh, we should have at least the joint width about 15 to 30 mm and we use the M20 concrete and this is how a brick, so basically this panel is very successful because it can be lifted by two people. You know, even a normal house, a smaller house you are constructing, two people can easily cast it on the side and it, they can lift it and they can put it on the roof. So I'm giving you a, a small film about how this panel is made. You can actually watch this and uh, from this video. And at the same time, over the top of it, this is how when you actually uh, make these intermediate beams and then over that you put these panels and over the top of it you have this uh, deck concrete. You know, So that actually gives a kind of finished roof section like this. The sky is the limit if you have a roof over your head. The basic needs to be met in a lifetime include a house and the most difficult part of the house building is the roof. Here's a progressive outlook to the whole idea of roof construction. This is the concept of making brick panels for building thereof and floor structure. Let's explain the process stepwise. First of all, a mold needs to be fabricated in the shape and size of the brick panel made from seasoned timber of good quality or steel sections. Length of the brick panel varies from 900 mm to 1200 mm depending upon the room size. Now comes the next step, casting of the brick panel. 
These panels are cast on a leveled ground. Prefab brick panels are made up of first class bricks and reinforced with two steel bars of 6 mm diameter. The gap is left deliberately for placing reinforcement into the brick panels. The width is normally kept at 530 mm. The mold can be removed after two hours of casting, depending on the weather conditions. The panel can be transported to the curing yard after 48 hours of casting in summers and 72 hours in winters. Pre-cast RCC joist should be cured for a period of 14 days and then dried for another 14 days before placing them on the supporting walls. Now, the brick panels are ready to use. For assembling the roof or the floor, first of all, the RCC joists are placed on the walls. Now, the brick panels are cleaned with wire brush to remove dust, loose sand and soil particles. Then, they are lifted and placed in position over the walls and between the pre-cast RCC joists to make the roof. Actually, the joints are placed over the concrete bed blocks. They are properly leveled with 1 is to 4 ratio of cement and sand mortar. All gaps between the panels are filled with M20 concrete. Later, Cement concrete of 35 mm thickness is laid over the panels and the joists with temperature reinforcement. So, the final roof structure looks somewhat like this. Beautiful and at the same time, reliable. Simplicity, economic and ease in adoption are a few characteristics that make this prefab brick panel system for roofing and flooring a great success. This system requires no shuttering, construction is faster and lesser quantity of cement and steel is required. This type of roof is almost 25% cheaper than RCC slab in the plains of northern India. So that from the bottom you actually see the brick, the brick as a surface but in the top you see as a flat slab. So similarly, we can use in the jakach form also. And also, this is some of the advancements which we can actually see in both the stone construction and the brick constructions. Of course, there are many, but I'm just showing you few in this particular lectures. And considering the timber also as a building material, we can also see that how the timber has been used in advanced building uh, technologies, especially in the timber frame technologies. Myself working with Benfield Advanced Timber Frame Technologies earlier in UK, so my personal interaction with these timber frame buildings, my learnings I'm also going to share with you. So in fact, uh, when we talk about uh, timber, you know, especially in the European countries or in the UK, 97% of the softwood timber used in UK comes from the Europe and here the forest area is increasing by the equivalent of 90 football pitches every hour of the day and night, you know. So first of all, you have to understand there is hardwoods, there are softwoods and there are the processed woods, okay. So 
when we talk about the softwoods and the hardwoods, they, we also talk about the FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council, which actually certifies that it has, pro, it has followed a proper supply chain process and it has made sure that the regeneration of the forest has been uh, in an accountable manner. Right? So, this FSC label actually guarantees that the trees that are harvested are replaced or allowed to regenerate naturally. When we are cutting down the forest, we should make sure that it should not hamper the wildlife or the flora or fauna uh, in any, uh, any way. So we have to make sure that it, the forest has to be protected also. And not only the animals, the indigenous people who used to survive on their forest, the sacred sites associated to it, how do you protect? So the FU, FSC gives an assurance that these future generations will be able to enjoy the benefits of the forest. So similarly, there are ways how you can employ these indigenous people into the construction process and we can also pro provide these uh, local uh, workers, providing them the training, safety equipment and also a decent salary. So wherever we can find this FSU, uh, FSC symbol, you know, so that is very important. So uh, that it has followed a particular process. And why do we have to, how do we choose uh, timber? Because the different species have different strength properties. You know, when we are actually choosing where we are applying, are you choosing hardwood completely for the facade treatment? Are you using it for a floor? Are you using for the uh, truss purpose? Are you using as a structural element? And there are also different building codes and regulations which we need to follow that. Like uh, in the UK, we have certain building uh, codes and regulations. Here, we have certain building codes and regulations. We need to follow how, what kind of timber we are using and how we can actually uh, do the visual strength grading, how the timber is graded. You know, So here, by looking at their natural futures such as knots, vein, and the slope of the grain, and any splits, any shakes, and they can actually grade it accordingly. Look, for example, you have uh, these uh, British standard, and uh, you have, this is the WPPA, is the reference to the species group, and this talks about the strength. C16 is the strength in class, and this is a dry graded timber. So in that way, uh, each and every uh, aspect will be observed, or if there is uh, an aspect you can see M, it is referred to as a machine graded. Okay. So like that in the British context, we have this British pine, British spruce, Douglas fir and larch and how we have the strength classes C14, C16 and C18, C22, C24 and TR26. So in that way, uh, the, there are uh, general structural and uh, special structural properties which actually determine these visual grades and also we have to understand that you know these grades for example if you want to use this size of a joist of 38 by 97 and you can go up to the maximum span of 1.76 if you use this but if you use the C24 you may go for 2.05 span so which means by just changing the grade of the timber you can actually assign your different spans even more uh, uh, larger spans also so for example you have 47 by 220, but you can see that uh, you can go up to 4.02 uh, 4, uh, 4 meters, but if you use the C24, you can go up to 4.4. Also, the changing of this center to center, like you have the center to center, either 400 or 600 mm, uh, that also matters a lot. So if you look at the traditional, uh, you know, the, the way the timber frame is constructed in the modern building setups, like you can have these timber stats and there's a two sections of the wall. One is the in, inner, inner section, which is the timber stats. The outer section is made with a normal brick wall. But whereas the inner sections, it will have the infill material, whether we'll also use the Cellotex, 70 mm Cellotex, and you'll also use uh, a 9 mm OSB oriented strand board and we will also use a what breathable membrane of Tyvek membrane. On the internal side, we'll have this lining material, it could be a plasterboard. So this is how the makeup of this is done. In case if you don't want the bricks, if you want to have the timber cladding, then you can have these battens, like the way I explained you in the previous lectures, and you can have these timber clads or any other 
nogging material or any other material you can actually work out. But the basic uh, fundamental skeleton goes with these timber studs and these uh, which are formulated as panels. In the prefab uh, constructions, what we actually do is we prepare the panels, we pre-engineer the whole building. So once we know that this is the layout of this building, we pre-engineer it and we actually uh, make the panels, we assemble all the insulations and everything and we basically erect them, send it to the site and we erect them in the site. So then there is no more constructions in the site, you know. So it is just only the erection part uh, rather than any preparation of it. The whole preparation can be designed uh, in the factory and in considering the insulations or any other things, we can also do that as a whole house also. So this is one of the house which I was working on and where we can see that uh, so we have these different types of roofs and how what we do is like you can see these elevations and different types of the roofs how they merger with uh, different levels. It's a little complex when we are actually making the roofs in uh, different heights and different directions. So what we do is we normally first when we get these plans we basically start at one point uh, taking as a reference. And then we start dividing that into panels, EP1, EP2, EP3, EP4, like that. And we make sure that not any panel is more than 2,400 meters, uh, sorry, uh, 2,400 uh, mm. So because that is the size which we get the 9 mm OSB sheet or we get the uh, panels so that it is easy to carry. And there is also another aspect when we are making these panel designs, we need to actually uh, consider the bridges which it has so that whether our truck can pass through with this load of that particular height or not. So that's why we mostly don't cross the 2400 mm wide panels and also the height. So in that way, we divide that and we go in a cyclic process. So we start with EP1, which EP means external panel, IP means internal panel. In IP also we take a reference. So in that way we develop all these panels and we draft all these sections. For example, we know the structural engineer have referred us to keep these beams here. So obviously integrating those beams, that's how my design of the panel is also made in the factory accordingly. So here we have these glue lamps and how the joist has to be done like you can I will also make the joist and here I can this is attic trusses. So the completely the roof and the floor are integrated together in an attic truss. So now I can actually send to the side the um, joist sizes cut exactly to the required size and I will just send them as one bunch and it is just nailed on to the top of the wall plates. So this is some of the uh, site work which I would like to show. So you have this beam and block foundations and which actually creates a level and over the top we have three layers of sole plate and this is the sole plate network and which we also check the diagonal uh, conditions whether they are uh, exactly formed in the rectangle or the required square format or not. And this is one of the restoration project where we are using the stone as an outside facade because that is located in a historic context. So in that way, the modern technology interfacing with the regular stone construction has been uh, adopted. So this is the attic truss, but if you see here, these trusses, because of its height, we have sent these trusses in two different uh, segments. So uh, there is a height restriction, so obviously the later piece has been sent later. So in that way, you can see these are the nail plates which are actually tying up these different sections. And what you are actually seeing is the oriented strand board and the Tyvek membrane is this. So this is the interiors of it where you can actually see these nail plates are fixed uh, as per the structural recommendation. And these are the pa panels but this is called the head binder and this is the top portion of the attic truss. And this is the 9M o o 9 mm OSB tree sheet. And you can see the window. What we do is here, we can actually see there's a lintel is fixed, but according to the building regulations, I need to have these external facade window at this size. So I have to fill the packer material into it. So in that way, and uh, after that, once we erect all these things, we fill these insulations, and then we cover with the plasterboard from inside. So similarly, we have to also follow certain, uh, uh, you know, the process how we actually put these um, plaster, uh, the OSB boards on the top of the roof and um, how 
one roof direction and another roof direction how they are merging at this point you know so in that way we uh, this these are all the temporary braces which will be removed later uh, for the temporary support they have able to put that and they also have to follow certain safety measures how they climb up and this is called bird's mouth where the truss is cut and it is actually placed on the top of the wall plate so that is called referred as a bird's mouth and similarly we have uh, these uh, 22 mm deck as a flooring material and so i mean that's a brief about uh, a prefab construction techniques and again uh, there are many um, this prefab uh, timber frame buildings were used in the disaster affected areas because that is something which we can repetitively do fast and we can actually erect in maybe 20 days of time so especially in the kashmir earthquake also they have adopted these techniques in the uh, in the pakistan region also so now uh, what are the challenges because you know our design our design becomes a challenge for this ensuring the sustainability because we can we reduce waste by design because if you do a mistake in our design process it will produce a waste in the factory it will pro produce much more waste in the construction site and to get it back and to send it back it will cost you the transportation cost so we need to plan with time and the money as well and especially the demand with the builders and uh, the owners uh, look for it so the prefab is one of the other solution which has been advanced with the timber frame technologies and uh, the main uh, challenge will be especially in cold countries the weather is a most crucial challenge how do we really uh, deliver on time so this is a brief about uh, the timber frame technologies and we did discuss about advancements in stone we did discuss about uh, advancements on the brick bat panels you know there are some low cost technologies but uh, the same CBRI also have come up with a document called Pahal, uh, which is uh, a compendium of the rural housing typologies. So this is, I'm giving the link of it, so one can actually go through it. So this is for your information. So how, what they did was they have documented about 13 states and each state, they have identified different zones. And for example, you have the state name and you have the state map with different housing zonations. For example, one in Assam, uh, a particular state will have a part of the region with hills, part of the region with uh, you know, a valley, or part of the region with the plain lands. So maybe they are associated with these with the different zones. And they've numbered it like this. So they have this UPA01, which is the state initial, which is Uttar Pradesh. And you have the zone A and the typology number. So within the zone, there may be two, three typologies. So like that, this is how they prepared a document to read for a common man to understand. Similarly, for Chhattisgarh, you can see zone C, and this is the typology number two. So the different, there are ram death technologies, there are wooden technologies, there are uh, brick technologies. Like for example, you have in the zone A, in the, the, uh, it is basically classified in the terms of uh, vulnerability of the natural hazards. And you can see there is a particular typology, what is the typical plan of it, what is the typical section of it, what is the materials of it, and what is the composition of it, what are the BOQs of it, the bill of quantities and the specifications, then how much it actually cost to make that building. So in that way, it gives a kind of very uh, systematic understanding of the typical traditional dwellings and of these different regions in a particular state. It becomes a kind of compendium of uh, all these variety of housing typologies, the traditional technologies, and the components they use, and how much it cost. You know, so for any user, it is very uh, friendly. So all these advancements has been taken place and still going on. So it is very important that you know, from the studies of vernacular architecture, we understand the materiality of it and how they really negotiate in the contemporary and the future context. And at the same time, we also discussed about the legality of it, how we can provide certain legal frameworks associated with it, and how we can actually provide certain guidance for these masons and the contractors, and how we can also develop certain self-build options, you know. So there's all variety of uh, understanding uh, or a variety of efforts have been put by various organizations and development of incorporating and integrating the local technologies and adapting to the newer demands and newer available materials. So it's always in the process. 
So I hope uh, this helps you with some understanding on the vernacular resources and materials. Thank you. Thank you.